Hi guys and welcome back to the Stack Dose Podcast. We're here with another Turbo Dose today and we're going to be talking about polymer and edema. So we're going to discuss the uh, sort of definition of it, the pathophysiology surrounding polymer edema. We're going to talk about some causes um, and the sort of assessment and management of this and hopefully it's sort of help you with your clinical presentations in practice and also when you come into simulation moving forward. Pulmonary edema, by definition, I suppose, is, is presence of excess fluid in the uh, the pulmonary interstitium uh, and the alveoli. Generally due to a cardiac cause, there are other causes, but I don't think we'll go into them too much. Normally, the pathophysiology starts with poor pump function, essentially meaning the ventricle cannot empty properly. This leads to several things, but mainly a rise in the amount of blood left in the ventricle at the end, which increases the end diastolic uh, volume and pressure. Now, this increase in, in pressure there will cause an increase in hydrostatic pressure in the pulmonary vessels. And this will cause fluid to move into the interstitium, eventually causing fluid to appear in the alveoli, which hinders gas exchange, generally oxygenation. As that oxygenation worsens, you get a catecholamine release, which causes vasoconstriction, and ultimately will increase the systemic vascular resistance again, which increases afterload, which impairs that left ventricle further. And then as a consequence of that as well, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is activated. So you get sodium and water retention as well, which again increases both preload and afterload. So essentially you get that sort of horrible cycle where, you, where you've where you got poor pump function and the consequences of that poor pump function lead to worsening pump function. Pump. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, say pump all <laughs> Think about causes of, of pulmonary edema then, Matt. So I think we can break those down, can't we? And with acute, subacute, and chronic, something I'm always reminded of um, in the case of a heart failure presentation is not to miss a myocardial infarction mm. or an acute coronary syndrome because actually uh, the heart failure could, could indeed be secondary to uh, uh, an acute coronary syndrome, which is then sort of causing that poor mechanical wall or valve motion um, and, and then giving us a, an acute heart failure. A few more of the uh, acute presentations, a sudden arrhythmia, uh, which will, which will of course reduce that ability to, to have a good cardiac output and therefore um, will we'll put you down that pathway, that negative sequelae of, of sort of having increased end diastolic volumes causing um, eventually your, your sort of pulmonary edema. Um, aortic dissection is of course another um, acute uh, presentation here. So you have, we have to really be thinking of those big cardiovascular presentations in the setting of heart failure and not classify heart failure just by itself before we sort of rule those out. And, and then finally, a, a pulmonary embolism causing a, a circulatory collapse, particularly those that, are, that have that sort of um, obstructive shock nature can really pop you into heart failure. But again, we're going to be wanting to treat the underlying cause of the pulmonary embolism Matt, what's what's some other causes um, of heart failure? Think of more sort of uh, chronic or, or subacute. Yeah, so from a, from the subacute perspective. Um... <clears throat> We have to be aware of things like sepsis, so anything causing sort of fluid shifts essentially. So if you get sort of fluid overloaded from from sepsis, um, or if you just get essentially that poor pump function from that systemic inflammatory response. Equally, thyrotoxicosis, so a thyroid storm. Um, normally, that's largely driven uh, arrhythmogenic, to be honest. So you, as, as you go into tachyarrhythmias, as you, as you say, you can't feel properly, you end up um, causing a bit of pulmonary edema that way. Any cause of volume overload or, or renal failure, particularly, is the one that comes to mind. But obviously, if you if you've got more intravascular fluid on board, then that eventually will lead to a bit of pulmonary edema. And then myocarditis again because of that impact on the pump function and the ability to fill correctly. Thinking about the, the, the chronic reasons as to why somebody may be in heart failure, these are your sort of really common insidious onsets of heart failure and things that you would actually see more likely in the community. One of the most common causes, hypertension, and then sort of thinking about things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy alongside that, that's going to generate over a significant amount of time. And then thinking also about uh, your patients with anemia and those with valvular pathologies. So in terms of the presentation then, Matt, what do you most commonly see in an acute presentation of heart failure in the ED? Unsurprisingly, shortness of breath is the feature that patients will complain of. It's often that sort of air hunger type uh, expression that, that you see where they, they really feel they can't get their, any air into their lungs. Obviously worse on lying flat, so orthopnea might be present. 
And you can get the, this history of uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or increased pillow use where because you're lying flat and your lungs are filling up with fluid, you need to use more pillows to keep you keep you upright. Now, often there's, the cough is quoted as being productive of a frothy pink sputum. Personally, I don't think I've ever seen that in practice. Joe, have you? Yeah, no, and I've, I think we, we were sort of having a chat about this before recording. I think actually this is one of those classic textbook symptoms uh, or signs that does it translate to practice, not in our experience. And actually, I, I don't see, I, I see potentially half of the patients who come in with cough, but it, not, not with that frothy pink type sputum. Um, and so I just think we need to be cognizant that not all of these symptoms in the textbooks actually translate into real life. I think then um, always important to remember chest pain and then working that up uh, as appropriate, particularly in the context of um, arrhythmias, aortic dissections and, and ACS. When in in a, an acute exacerbation of heart failure, those who have got that classic diaphoretic or sort of sweating um, appearance and those who are pallor, uh, particularly sort of compared to usual, that's an acute presentation. My experience is that heart failure actually presents in a, in a broad array um, of signs of symptoms in general practice. And quite often what you can get is patients who are quite um, sort of overloaded and it presents in... Uh, in, in a number of different ways, perhaps a, a, an acute delirium, um, perhaps a, a reduced, uh, just simply a reduced function, um, often lower respiratory tract infection type signs of symptoms, and and often patients will actually notice bilateral painful leg swelling prior to actually noticing that they've had a gradual onset of, of dyspnea over the last couple of weeks. It will be the legs that they, they notice first. And so actually sort of corroborating that and thinking bilaterally swell, swollen legs, sign of heart failure, maybe we should look more centrally for that, will kind of allow you to make that diagnosis. So when assessing these patients, we need to be cognizant um, of the following really. So these patients in acute presentations will often have a high respiratory rate, so they'll be tachypneic. They may often be hypoxic and showing signs of respiratory distress, so looking at your intercostal muscles, um, increased work of breathing, etc. Skin colour and, and sort of sweating and pallor, obviously really, really important. Um, on top of that, looking at the chest, bilateral adventitious crackles, often quite coarse sounding, but um, quite frequently you can actually hear audible fremitus from these patients um, without even going onto the chest. So you know actually what you're going to find before you, before you listen to them. They, they may be tachycardic. Really, really important to, to get an ECG, look for those underlying causes that, that we've discussed. Fever is generally absent in these patients. It's really important to think about the differentiation between a lower respiratory tract infection, which is more often unilateral, productive, purulent, sputum, cough with fever versus bilateral adventitious findings without fever, but of course bearing in mind that typically patients will, will often present with heart failure and, and lower respiratory tract signs or symptoms mm -hmm. so they can coexist. Chest x-ray might be able to show uh, bilateral so pleural effusions bilaterally, uh, cardiomegaly clearly from, from the previous causations that we've talked about, some upper lobe venous diversion and, and edema sort of in the interstitial or, or alveo alveolar spaces, so otherwise known as a sort of back wing distribution. And obviously then you're looking for those um, curly B lines, which are a classic finding. An arterial blood cast is important, and, and uh, what we want to be looking for here is the presence of hypercapnia, which, which suggests an alternate diagnosis, or suggests that the patient is actually in, in, in extremis, so that they're a peri-arrest from heart failure. So management, again, as ever, Joe, is going to, going to be an ABCD, as you know. We're going to sit them up, so bolt up right 90 degrees, we want them nicely sat up in the bed, and we're going to put some high flow oxygen as part of our airway intervention, essentially. Before we do anything else, we're going to sit them up, right, put them on oxygen. And then, obviously, we're going to work through our ATOE, looking for those findings that you just discussed. But key in terms of management, diuretics are important. So we often go with, with furosemide IV, anything between 10 and 50 milligrams initially, depending on the degree of fluid overload. This obviously increases fluid excretion, which is going to reduce your afterload. Just be aware that if you're giving high doses, these can cause a bit of hypotension, and later on they can cause a bit of hyponatremia, which might impact your fluid balance. Nitrates, again, are helpful. They're vasodilatory. They reduce preload and a bit of afterload as well. Um, you can use a GTN spray initially if you're in the community. But in, in hospital, we often use IV infusions of, of what's known as isoket, which is isosorbide dinitrate. Obviously, keeping a close eye on the blood pressure. Opioids are important. They help reduce the agitation and that sensation of respiratory distress, like they do in palliative care patients. 
NIV will touch on, we won't really go into it too much, it's sort of beyond the, the realm of F1s generally, but it's important to be aware of. CPAP is helpful, so that increases oxygenation, just providing a continuous positive airway pressure to splint the alveoli open. Obviously different to BiPAP, provides a high level of pressure on inspiration to help with CO2 clearance, which are using things like COPD. As Joe was mentioning with the ABG, you expect largely a type 1 respiratory failure picture without hypercapnia in pulmonary edema, hence why CPAP's more useful. So just to summarise pulmonary edema, the pathophysiology is related to a spiral of poor pump function, causing increased fluid accumulation and worsening hypoxia. In terms of presentation and assessment, remember these patients, certainly in flash pulmonary edema, are going to be highly short of breath, they're going to be sweaty, they're going to be pale, with evidence of respiratory distress and hypoxia. It's important to try and differentiate between other common causes. Useful clinical features to look for include fever, chest x-ray and arterial blood gas, which typically shows more of a type 1 respiratory failure. Management-wise include an ABCD approach, sitting the patient bolt upright with high flow oxygen, ferrosamide, nitrates, opiates and CPAP.